So many people trying to fill a void inside. So many questions asking how, asking why. I might not have all the answers, but I've tasted and I've seen. There's a better path for Jesus. There's no going back for me. Morning. Good morning. Oh, that's loud. Nice. Welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tyler, uh, and I serve as the youth pastor here at Richfield. Um, and I just want to say welcome here this morning. Uh, we believe that God has something so amazing planned this morning, as He does every Sunday. But this Sunday is no different. Um, so thank you for being here. And if you are new with us this morning, there's a little perforated section on your bulletin that we would ask you to tear out and to fill out as much of the information as you feel comfortable filling out. Um, it's just so we can get to know you more, know how we can serve you, know how if you would like to serve. Um, we would love to get you involved in any way, shape, or form that you would like, um, as well as any prayer requests that you have um, so that we can pray for you um, and, again, do anything that, we, that you would like us to do for you. So thank you. Within reason, yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so, a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, last week was Faith, was Faith Promise Sunday, um, and it was so great to hear uh, the sermon last week as we heard about uh, missions and what's going on in the world. Um, and so many of you made generous contributions to that, so thank you guys for that. Um, and if there is any of you who still want to turn in the, those slips, um, to make a donation to that. You still can, uh, so if you want, you can turn those in. Um, and on the 17th, we are having a prayer vigil um, this season. So if you, if you believe that prayer has power, which I hope that answer is yes, um, we would love to see you there that Friday, the 17th, um, as we pray together for a couple of hours. Um, I also want to say thank you to the security team that we have here. Um, if you are a member or are interested in becoming a member of the security team, uh, there is a meeting after church um, today um, in the conference room. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, be there after service to hear what, um, what you can do about that. Um, and as always, thank you so much for your generosity, just in general. Um, it, there's a lot that can be done with that. There's a lot that God is doing through that, and so we just thank you so much. Uh, and if that's you this morning, if you are feeling generous or if you're dropping in your daily tithes, you can do that by either the boxes in the back. Uh, you can give online um, or you can mail it in either way. So again, thank you for being here this morning, and would you pray with me as we begin our time of worship this morning? God, we thank you. Uh, thank you for this space. Thank you for the opportunity to be here together. Um, we thank you for everything that you do. God, I just want to take a moment and just praise you for who you are as a loving and powerful and merciful and caring God. We know that this morning. We know who you are. And we just want to take a moment out of our busy days our busy lives to focus on that. Thank you for who you are. And I pray that you're with us as we go throughout this service and that you're with us as we go. In your name, amen. Well, welcome to worship this morning. Today we have the special honor of having some ladies that are going to come play uh, flutes for us to kind of help us begin in worship. As they do, Psalm 98 reminds us that worship isn't just about singing with our voices. 
uh, anything and everything can bring praise to God. Listen to this verses out of this psalm. It says, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of ram's horns, and shout for joy before the Lord the King. Let the sea resound in everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands and let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord. Let them make music for the Lord their God. So would you help me welcome these ladies this morning and listen as they praise God with their instruments. Amen. Well, let's stand together and add our voices to his praise this morning. Let us make music for the Lord. Joy in the house of 
of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Because we were the beggars, but now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, but now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted. Redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing it out, church. Because we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. church. He is so good, isn't he? So many great reasons to praise him. Sing it with us. Oh, I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure and praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered. Praise when surrounded Cause praise is the waters My enemies drown in As long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to praise the Lord of my soul still in control my praise is a weapon it's more than a sound my praise is the shout that brings Jericho down as long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to praise
All right, let's praise Him for all of these reasons. I praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. Praise because you rose and defeated the grave. I praise because you're faithful. Praise because you're true. Praise because there's nobody greater than you. I praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. Praise because you rose and defeated the grave. I praise because you're faithful. Praise because you're true. Praise because there's nobody greater. Sing it out. of who he is. So wherever you find yourself today, make the choice to praise him. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails. He won't fail me now. You won't fail me now. In the waiting, the same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy. When my heart is heavy all my days, oh yes, I will. Oh, I count on one thing, the same God that never fails, you won't fail me. church so yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless your name oh yes I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days oh yes I will for all my days oh to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand against, I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand sing it out, I choose to praise. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your.
free the captives and you're freeing hearts right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You touch the lepers then. I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. You are the same Now, you know with that song what we're doing, right? We're closing a gap. We're closing the gap between then and now. And the level at which you close that gap has to do according to your faith and your trust and your belief that he is who was faithful then is faithful now. Who's going to join me today in closing the gap? Amen? Hallelujah. So what we're going to do is, as the praise team sings, if you uh, would like to come and find a place of prayer, if you'd like to be anointed for healing or any other situation in your life, come forward or right where you are. Let's close that gap today. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. We stand on your faithfulness, Lord. We're so glad that we can stand. And Lord, I sense in this congregation there are some today that says, man, it just doesn't seem like it ever works for me. I have a hard time. Lord, whoever that person is or several persons, I pray that you would help all of us to realize that it's not always something we feel, but it's what we stand on in faith believing the truth, believing the truth of your promises found in the scriptures. We believe, Lord, and as we allow that belief to grow in our hearts and lives, Lord, the time and the place in which you continue to bring the kind of fulfillment from which we seek, that we seek, will come. So I pray, Father, for ev that every single person in this room will not be excluded in any way from the power of your encouraging heart the power of your encouraging love that you want to share with us. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd be with those who are sick. Those who are not able to be with us today, they may be joining us online. We pray for special healing and that you would put a stop to any further progression of any illness, Lord. We come against, Father, in your name, other kinds of chronic illness. We just pray, Father, for new steps toward healing, toward new life, and toward hope. We thank you and we praise you that you are that same God. We pray that you bring healing in relationships. We pray that you bring healing and hope and help, Father, for all the different areas of our lives where we need to turn things over to you, where we need to step forward in obedience and really become more than just believers in the front door, but to become real disciple, disciples and followers of yours. We just pray that you would just close all of those gaps, Lord. We thank you, God. We pray that you'd be with those who are grieving. Lord, we just pray a special surrounding of love around Lynette Salo today and her family with Scott, her husband, and others, Lord, who are affected by the passing of her sister this week. 
We just pray special comfort and peace that can come only from you. And help us to all remember to be supportive of people that we know around us, Lord, who are grieving and who need comfort. We just pray that you would extend a special grace to Lynette and Scott and their families today. Others, Lord, continue to struggle with grief, and we just pray that you would just give us the hope and the sense, Lord, that even though we struggle with loss, that, that you could fill that and can bring healing in that, Lord, if we continue to trust in you. So, Lord, just work across this congregation today. Be with Pastor Allen as he opens up the truth of the scriptures to us. We just pray that your word would become alive in a new way and will bear the fruit Lord, you have promised that when you send your word and when you send it out, Lord, it will accomplish that for which it is intended. So we ask that you remove any barrier to that today. Thank you again for our time together. We just pray that you would just bless those of us gathered in this space and those joining us online. I bless them all in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of God. And all of God's people said together, thank you. You may be seated. Well, praise the Lord. Try that again. Praise the Lord. Praise Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. I am so glad to be able to be here together with you this morning, and I want to remind you of something. <clears throat> Jesus said <clears throat> that we are his friends, and he loves us. You hear that this morning? Remember what Jesus said. Jesus said that he loves you. Grab your Bibles with me if you would like this morning. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13 and remember that Jesus loves you. He not only loves us, those of us who are gathered here together this morning, but he loves everybody that we care about. And he even loves all of those people that we don't know well enough to care about yet right now all around the world. Isn't that wonderful? Everyone. Amen. Jesus loves. We used to sing about that as children, didn't we? Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's right. Somebody else remembers it. He does. He loves us this morning. Remember what Jesus said. If you don't hear anything else this morning, remember that Jesus loves you and he loves everyone around us today. Um, Jan uh, got one of those interesting letters a couple of weeks ago where they invited her to participate in uh, the American uh, jurisprudence system. She was called to jury duty. Uh, and uh, thankfully, you know, by the end of it, she didn't have to serve, but it reminded me of when, uh, when we lived in Colorado and I got one of those letters and I had to go down to the, to the courthouse building where they did all that. And, I, and you go in, you know, and, and they start to, to call your name or your number uh, and decide whether or not they want you to be a juror. And so I'm in, it was a really big courtroom. Uh, and uh, in there, we're going through that process. And, of course, everybody in there is trying to convince the judge that they're not fit to serve, right? Because they don't want to have to serve. Uh, and uh, I remember this one guy, you know, uh, juror number nine, I think. And he's up there, and he says to the judge, Your Honor, I don't think that I could effectively serve but I, because I'm really, really, really hard of hearing, and uh, the judge said, okay, then you're excused. And he said, I'm sorry, what'd you say? And the judge said, you're excused. So the guy said, thanks. And he headed out uh, the long walk back to the back door on his way out of the courtroom. And while this guy's making his way out, the judge leaned over to his assistant there. And he said, uh, juror number nine's excused, but please go ahead and pay him for the day. And from the back of the courtroom, juror number nine said, thanks, judge. <laughs> 
Now, where I grew up, we call that selective hearing. Sele any of you parents understand selective hearing? Uh, in Matthew chapter 13, the question is not so much about what's being said, but about whether we really hear what Jesus is saying. Do we hear, do we today remember what Jesus said? Matthew 13 is amazing. I love this, this chapter um, here. Jesus tells a bunch of parables in sequence, just parable after parable after parable, seven of them actually in Matthew chapter 13. And so the, the disciples asked Jesus, why? He's just telling rapid fire parables in a row. Why do you teach in parables? And Jesus said he taught from parables because most of the people who would hear him weren't really choosing to listen. People were coming to him in great crowds. It was, the crowd was so big that he had to be in a boat out on the lake, the edge of the lake, to amplify what he was saying. And yet he said, most of them aren't really hearing me. I watched a magician on TV. It was amazing. I love to watch them do that kind of show. You know, it's just, it's fascinating, astonishing. I love a good show, right? Well, most of the people who were coming to hear Jesus were coming for a good show. You know, they'd heard that this miracle worker was nearby and, and they wanted to see a miracle, to see a healing. Maybe they themselves wanted to experience something from Jesus. But they really weren't interested, most of them, in connecting with Jesus himself. They weren't yet connecting the reality that Jesus himself is the answer to the real need that we have in our lives. It's not just the things that Jesus can do, but, but connecting with Jesus himself is the real answer to the real need that we have in our lives. They, they weren't there yet. See, Jesus says our hearts are connected to our hearing. <laughs> For those of us who aren't listening right now, Jesus said our hearts. <laughs> I'm having so much fun. I don't know if you are or not. You just, oh man. The condition of my heart determines my ability to hear. So Jesus taught in parables for the people who just wanted something impressive. And he said these people would be ever hearing but never quite understanding. Then later he explained the parables to the people who really wanted to understand. See, Jesus wants for all of us to really get him. He wants us to. He wants us to remember to know him, to hear him, and to remember what he says. And in today's parable, the one we're going to look at here in just a second, Jesus says, if we will really listen, God will sow, he will plant deeply his truth in our lives. If we will keep listening and learning, it will grow beyond anything reasonable. It's a God thing when it grows like that. See, when I really listen to Jesus, God's life, God's power is just planted and, and grown beyond anything reasonable in my life. So look with me in Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 1, where it says this. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and he sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it while all of the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying... A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly 
because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were quickly scorched and they withered because they only had very shallow root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. You know, right now this morning, there are farmers all around us who are out plowing and planting, right? It is that time of year. Our nation has some of the most skillful farmers that have ever walked the face of the earth, and they have the finest equipment in the world. So because of their skill and the tools that they can use, America literally helps to feed the world. But in Jesus' day, the farmers had a lot less to work with. And, and, and the picture we see here in Matthew chapter 13 is probably, it was probably this time of year. Uh, because Jesus is sitting there in the boat. The crowd is gathered all around and he's probably looking over and there's some farmers out planting. And so he uses it as an illustration. The fields then were typically small and narrow and very often rocky. And, and so the farmer Rather than plowing and cultivating at that time, that wasn't typical. They would just take their bag of seed that they would carry and they would just scatter the seed on the ground. And wherever it landed, it landed. And, and they would just keep scattering seed, flinging the seed out across the ground. Jesus looked and saw that and he said, this illustrates what's happening in the kingdom. Now, later he explained this parable to those who were seriously listening. But notice something, even to those who were seriously listening to him, even to those of us who are seriously listening to Jesus this morning, Jesus continues to challenge us to listen even more carefully. Verse 18, here's Jesus' explanation. Listen, he's talking to the apostles and to us. Listen. Are you listening? Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. See, when, when I connect with Jesus, when I begin to, get, to really get connected with Jesus, then, then I will want to know Jesus more. And, and I will try to know Jesus more. And I will work to know Jesus more. Until I really get connected with Jesus, I am hearing impaired spiritually. And I am totally unaware of my limited condition. I had a guy recently who, who, uh, who said to me, you know, Pastor, that was a really good sermon last week. The part that I could hear. <clears throat> Another guy called me and he said, you know, I was there and, and, and I, I really enjoyed the part of your sermon that I paid attention to. <laughs> I love honesty. Most days. <laughs> God is always speaking. Right now. Right now, the Holy Spirit is here. And he is talking to you. Right now, the Holy Spirit is saying, Jesus loves you. God wants wonderful things in your life. God has answers to the questions that you are seeking. God desires to go deeper with you today. He wants to help you understand what it means even more to live as Jesus' follower. And Jesus to all of us, is saying, you know, like the old commercial, can you hear me now? Listen. Jesus is still encouraging, challenging, inviting us to listen more carefully. Because, and then he goes through several challenges that people faced, problems, things that interrupted their hearing. And, and he says that, that there are hearers with closed hearts. Verse 19, 
When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and doesn't really comprehend it, understand it, believe it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. That, Jesus said, is what he meant by the seed that was sown along the path. Think, you know, concrete sidewalk, the path. Now look at verse 19, does not understand it. That phrase, actually the word understand, it's a compound word. And and it really means to comprehend, to understand, to embrace knowledge as truth. See, when somebody hears the word but doesn't embrace Jesus' word as the truth, as quickly as possible, the evil one snatches away that seed that was right there. They hear it, but they, they, they hesitate to believe it. Immediately, the evil one does everything in his power in order to push that truth away, to get it away from them, to, to devour that seed so that it won't continue to have opportunity to get into their lives. See, whatever is kept on the surface of my life is quickly snatched away. Jesus is saying some people's hearts are as spiritually hard as a sidewalk. And and sometimes maybe they don't want to hear. Maybe they realize, maybe they realize that that the truth that Jesus speaks will, will condemn some aspect of the way that they're choosing to live their lives. Maybe, maybe they've been hurt in the past and they've hardened their hearts. So the enemy does everything in his power to keep them from hearing. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say, you know, the evil one, Satan, the devil, works in every possible way to prevent people from hearing and and prevent people from understanding about Jesus. Hardened hearing. Hardened heart. I I remember... um, Jan was a pastor before we got married, and we got married. I became her co-pastor in Bowling Green, Ohio. And I remember uh, in that first church, shortly after I went there, I, I, uh, in Bowling Green, Ohio, I, I needed to go downtown to pick up a part for, uh, for one of our musicians' instruments. So I went down to the main music store downtown Bowling Green, Ohio, to buy something. And I, I remember I was talking to the sales guy there in the store. He happened to also, I found out, be the owner of that store He asked who I was, and I told him as we were just chit-chatting. And uh, he said, oh, you're the pastor of the Church of the Nazarene. I said, yeah, co-pastor of the Church of the Nazarene. And then he said, did you go to Nazarene Theological Seminary? I'm downtown Bowling Green, Ohio, talking to somebody I've never met before who, you know, ponytail, real, you know, interesting musician dude. who's asking me about Nazarene Theological Seminary, <clears throat> which is, yeah, hundreds of miles away in Kansas City. And, and I said, yes. He said, uh, so did I. I said, seriously? <laughs> and the conversation really went downhill from there. I wanted to talk to him. I mean, it was like, really? You know, we're in a university community, and and suddenly we're talking about sharing an alma mater. And and I know what happens at NTS, and, and, and apparently he did too, and all these things about, I'm like, really? I mean, all NTS does is train pastors. He didn't want to talk about it. He never would talk about it. I discovered secondhand that he had turned away from God and church and everything. And, you know, leave him alone. Well, that he told me. Um, I spoke with him occasionally after that. But we never made any progress on friendship or, or on spiritual connection. And the last I knew, his heart was like concrete. There are a lot of different reasons that our hearts can become hard or be hard. But Jesus warns that that makes us incredibly vulnerable to to the enemy. 
Then he says there are hearers with shallow roots. Verse 20, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. Joy. But since they have really shallow roots, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of following Jesus, the word, they quickly fall away. Now, something interesting here. Fall away is in the passive. Now, hold on to your neighbor. You know, this is not going to be English class, but it's in the passive voice. That means he was caused to fall away by the negative circumstances that he encountered. He's affected by the negative circumstances where following Jesus for him in his life was difficult. Okay. He was, he was, anybody had any challenges in their lives lately? Jesus, notice the verse now. Look at this with me. Jesus does not blame the negative circumstances for the individual falling away. Jesus blames the shallow roots, the shallow soil. It's interesting, the word here in the original for fall away is a form, it, the word scandalizo, it's, it's, it's where we get our word scandal. Its original focus was about stumbling or falling. Lots of people have been impacted, hurt, by scandals of all kinds um, in God's people. I, I hate when I hear about churches that have let misunderstandings grow into conflict, which damage the church and damage people. I'm always saddened if I hear about a church leader who's fallen into some kind of sin and had to leave their church under a cloud of scandal. But Jesus' focus here. It wasn't necessarily on the problems in a church or the problems with, with, with church leaders. Of course, that's a problem. I mean, we need to always work on fixing that. But that wasn't Jesus' focus here in this verse. Jesus' focus was on those who started following him, but whose roots were so shallow that when negative things happen, whatever kind of negative things they were, they allowed it to cause them to be uprooted, ripped away, fall away from following Jesus. And Jesus says they're lost. Jesus said problems are going to come. All God's children have problems. Problems are going to come. I don't like it. None of us like it. But problems are going to happen. In fact, Jesus a couple of times suggested that we may have extra problems because we're following him. I'd say, Jesus, that's not real good, you know, salesmanship, but, but it's the truth. But the real scandal is when our connection to Jesus is so, so shallow that when we face problems of whatever kind, we lose our focus on following Jesus. See, Jesus' encouragement to us today, remember what he said. His encouragement is for us to, to dive in and for our faith to get deeper every day. And, and, and it's challenging to follow Jesus in every part of my life, especially when what Jesus says and, and what our culture says sometimes diverge. And... and and cultural priorities shift and change. But Jesus' word is absolutely, his character is absolutely consistent. And following Jesus means going deeper and deeper and deeper with him. It means discerning God's priorities and, and discriminating between God's best and, and the expectations that we may encounter from others around us. Jesus says that when we don't keep going deeper, 
that when we confront a challenge to our faith, we can be uprooted and not continue to stick with him. And then he says there are hearers who have so many other priorities that God can get crowded out. Verse 22. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and make it unfruitful. I think, I think, I think the biggest obstacle for following Jesus for so many across the church is right here. It's, it, it is a world filled, lives filled with so many good things that we need and want to do. Uh, any of you got complicated lives? <laughs> got busy schedules? You know, there is never enough time to do everything that we want, is there? You know, I, I have said, I, I think sometimes that it would be fun to live a dozen different lives so I could pursue all the different careers and, and, and passions and interests that fascinate me. But I can't. And neither can you. I have one life. And it is going really fast. And the Bible says that nothing but what I completely devote to Jesus will matter beyond this lifetime. One man said, I have held many things in my possession, but only what I have devoted to God has endured. Before um, we came here to pastor, Jan and I taught at Nazarene Bible College in Colorado Springs. And, and over the 50-year history of that Bible college, all it's there for is to train pastors. And, and over the 50 or so years history of that Bible college, thousands of students from all over the United States and many of them from around the world moved their families to Colorado to study and to prepare for ministry. Uh, this wasn't your normal college where, you know, it's right out of high school graduates. The average age of the students at Nazarene Bible College was 42. These were people who were adults in the church with families, and God called them, and they uprooted and moved and did changed everything because they were following God's call. But then when we were there, I discovered that the state of Colorado has more Nazarene Bible College grads than any other state in the Union. I asked my friend who taught there the, almost the entire time of the school's existence what was going on. And he said, well, over the years, many, many people have moved to Colorado following God's call. But school is really hard. And, and life, trying to do school and, and, and work and family and Every other complex thing that is a part of life is really complicated. And, and many of them finished school, and many of them ended up not finishing school. But they found out Colorado is a really cool place to live. And they built really good lives in Colorado. And pursuing their jobs and lives in all of its complexity choked out their commitment to follow Jesus' call. And so for many of them, they stopped listening. And they couldn't remember what Jesus said. And they never took that next step with Jesus. Now for them, that meant ministry. But that's, Jesus wasn't talking to pastors here. I mean, he was, but he wasn't exclusively talking to pastors here. Jesus said this risk is there for everyone. One man called this, this struggle with, with so much complexity, living the strangled Christian life. He said, the weeds strangle out the good seed. He said, in the strangled Christian life, there is not that singular, absolute priority focus on Jesus. Instead, in the strangled, 
strangled life, there are many, many equally important priorities. But then Jesus offers us hope. He says there are hearers who embrace him thoroughly. Verse 23. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understand it, understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Good soil. People who are listening to Jesus now. They understand. They embrace Jesus as truth. People who hear about and embrace Jesus are good soil. And good soil produces a great crop. When I think about this, I always think about my friend Todd who came bouncing into my office in in that first church that we were pastoring. And he was uh, early 20s at that time. He's wearing a ball cap. He's a big guy wearing a ball cap with a huge grin on his face and a wife beater. I remember that. I mean, he's just, he's just Todd. And he told me about how his grandma was this really devoted Christian lady in another church. And she'd prayed for him, but he had lived wild and crazy. And, uh, and then one day, Jesus, the week before, got a hold of him. And I mean, he gave his heart to Jesus. And when he gave his heart to Jesus, that was that. And he went in all the way with Jesus. And no matter how hard we tried to teach him about Jesus, he just wanted more and more and more. And he just bubbled over with everybody around him. And people all around Todd wanted to become Christians because of this guy. And he was constantly helping people find Jesus and go deeper with Jesus. And he became a great leader in that church. And as far as I know, continues to pursue leadership in the kingdom. And he demonstrated the fruit. Jesus said, you know, it'll produce a crop 30, 60, 100 times. John says the fruit of the Spirit is is produced in us with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and all those beautiful characteristics that reflect the character of God go deep, going deeply into us. And it will shine out of us so that it reproduces Jesus in the people all around us. When we reflect him. And yeah, there will be challenges and difficulties. And not everybody will want to hear or experience or see our Jesus. Jesus said, just keep planting seeds. You know, there's always going to be birds. Keep planting seeds. The farmer keeps planting his seeds on every type of soil. Keep sowing seed into the lives of people all around us who seem to just be impossible. God doesn't give up on anybody. Does he? God doesn't. He just keeps planting seed. Honestly, it may sometimes feel like it's not making any difference. But Jesus didn't say here, well, when it looks like, you know, they're they're difficult, then, you know, you need to plant your seeds a lot more carefully. No, he didn't say that. He said, keep planting seeds. Some of it's going to go in good soil. Don't be discouraged when you're planting seed. Three quarters of the seed that this farmer planted didn't survive. But the seed that did yielded a bumper crop. Look what Jesus said. The farmer planted four seeds. Three of them didn't produce a crop. But that fourth seed produced a hundred other seeds. How many of you would like to have that kind of return on your investment in your portfolio? (laughs) You know, Jesus is asking us to remember what he said. And what he said is, how's the soil in your life? I... So I'm asking this morning, Lord, how is the quality of the soil in my heart? Jan and I were talking about it last night because both of my parents uh, had significant hearing loss. And so the odds are I'm probably going to experience hearing loss. Well, at first, when you start to lose your hearing, everybody around you knows it except you, right? Can you hear me now? I want to be good soil. I've been asking, Lord, 
How's the quality of the soil in my heart? I want to encourage you just for a moment with me to ask that same question. Because maybe, just maybe, for some of us here, our hearts are starting to get hard-packed and beaten down. Maybe by a little bit of neglect of the things of God. Maybe you're hurt or angry with God. Let me encourage you to allow God's Spirit to break up that hard ground and make you receptive again to Jesus and His Word. Maybe the soil in your heart is just kind of shallow and you're at risk of, of everything being torn away. Ask the Spirit to take you deeper. Ask the Spirit to break through those rocky places that you just can't seem to get through. Maybe your heart is divided. You've got all these priorities that are competing with God for first place in your heart. Ask the Spirit to help. Ask the Spirit to help you make God your first love. To make His priority your first priority. To make Him your first priority. Maybe this morning your heart is really good, rich soil, and you are just going fast forward with Jesus. Then thank Him for the crop that is growing in your heart and from your life and ask Him to make you even more fruitful. God can take any kind of soil and He can make it productive. We, we just need to ask. So would you join me for a moment? Let's pray together. Let's just ask. Jesus, thank you. Oh, Jesus, thank you that you kept planting seed and you are still planting seeds all around us. Thank you that you planted seed in my heart and you helped it to take root. Thank you that you've done that for so many of us. But Lord, you know what we've gone through, what we're going through, what we're experiencing in our lives and in our lives with you. So I pray for each one of us here today. Lord, break up the unplowed ground. Move deeply into every heart and mind. Unlock our impaired hearing and seeing and experiencing you. And take us deep, deep, deep into the love of Jesus, I pray. Thank you so much, God. This is your desire for us. That's why you taught us this parable. Please, make this parable go deep and linger in each one of our ears and help us to remember what Jesus said. I pray in the matchless name of Jesus, our Lord and only Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. Hi, I'm Pastor Jan Deuce, Associate Pastor of Connection here at Richfield. I hope you enjoyed our time together in worship today as much as I did. You know, there are so many things that we have going on here, and we want to make it easy for you to learn more about us and get involved. One of the newest things we have going are life groups. These are forming now through the month of May. If interested, use this QR code to fill out a form, which will be sent directly to me, and I'll put you in a group. There are many other good things to discover. Simply go to richfieldnaz.com click on the Ministries tab and find children, teens, or adults. 
After you go to one of these tabs, find there a list of other kinds of classes with dates, times, and places. My own contact information is at the bottom of the page, and I would love to hear from you to answer any of your questions. Have a great week.